Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Happy Easter from our family to yours. Hello, everyone, and happy Easter from the Donaldson. We miss everyone, and hope you're doing swell. We each have our favorite Bible verses, but we feel this one is good for the times we are in right now, and also the Easter weekend. Psalm 31, 24. Be of good courage, and ye shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. We wish everyone a blessed, happy Easter, and look forward to seeing Happy Easter! Good morning, everyone. We'd like to wish all of our church family and our friends a very blessed Easter. Good morning. I'd like to give you one of our favorite Bible verses. It's John 3:17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Happy Easter! Our favorite Bible verse is, Be still and know that I am God. Miss everyone. Love everyone. We want to wish you all a happy Easter. We miss you all. Love you. Hope you have a great day. Um, one of our favorite verses is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Love you. Have a good day. Amen. ARTCB church family, happy Easter to everyone. Wish we could be with you, but of course that's not going to happen. I uh, was looking forward to having a cantata sometime this morning, but uh, maybe next year. We just want to say hello to everybody and let you know we missed you very much and uh, can't wait to get back together with you very, very soon. My favorite verse is Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Good morning to all of our Ripley Tabernacle Baptist Church family. We hope that you are safe and healthy during this time. And remember Habakkuk 3.18, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Happy Easter. Happy Easter from the Wilson family. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13 Hello, and happy Easter from the Woodland family. Well, it's just me and the dog. Mom doesn't have any makeup on, Dad is starting to look like Robinson Crusoe, and Savannah doesn't see a reason to take a bath anymore. It's true. <laughs> anyway, we love and miss you guys, and have a happy Easter. It's hard to believe it's Easter uh, once again. It seems like this year's flying by. Um, as I was thinking about this time of year, I was thinking about how many times Jesus said to his disciples and those around him, he said that he was going to be crucified and three days later he was going to raise again. And of course, that's what we're celebrating this weekend. But I'm also reminded of the Lord's faithfulness to his word. And this year, I want to say that I'm just thankful for the Lord Jesus and his faithfulness to his word, his faithfulness to his promises. And I just want to thank him for how good he's been to our family this year. And I uh, just want to thank him for the privilege of being able to serve him uh, at our church. And uh, we just want to say that we love you and we miss you all very much. Happy Easter. Easter. Good morning, Ripley Tabernacle Baptist Church. Uh, happy Easter. We praise the Lord. Another day to celebrate his resurrection and all that he's done for us. Even though we can't meet physically together in a church, praise the Lord, that because he raised from the dead, uh, we don't have to be in a church to worship him or to praise him or to come into his presence. And we're just so thankful for all that he's done. One verse I'll share with you real quick, uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hope you have a happy Easter, and it was great talking to you. Hello, this is Pastor Jeff and Miss Denise, and this Easter Sunday, we just wanted to wish you a happy Easter, and I'm so thankful to be your pastor and have that privilege of 
ministering alongside each of you. And when I think of Easter, when I think of Resurrection Sunday, today I believe in the, in the life of a Christian. This is the greatest day of the year. And I, I trust and, and, and hope and pray that it is for you as well. I pray you enjoy the services today and that they'll be a blessing to you. God bless you. I pray you have a great day. Judah's face, torches set ablaze, weapons drawn in hate, the chill of night. Friends who fled in fear, the sound of Peter's tears, the way that people cheer. Crucify a nightmare coming true before your eyes. What was it that was going through your mind? You thought of us. Still have 
against the silence in the sky but when you ask for God to tell you why you thought of us to hear the news you thought of us every one of us and all your love for us caused you to stay we were the very ones who turned of us. Well, good Easter Sunday evening to you out there in Facebook and YouTube land. It's good to be with you all once again. Uh, hope you've had a blessed day. I hope you've been, uh, been able to enjoy the service this morning and uh, looking forward to being with you again, being with you this evening. Um, if you would take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. I want to preach for a little bit for just a few minutes here uh, on the agony of the cross, the agony of the cross, Luke chapter 24, <clears throat> verse number 6, the Bible says, He is not here, but is risen. Remember how He spake unto you when He was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time together this evening. We thank you for what this day means and what it represents. Lord, I pray that you'd help us now, Lord, to get out of the way, and I pray that you'd have your way in this service tonight. Just pray that you'd help us to, to speak clearly and plainly. Lord, I pray that we'd speak with your power and boldness, Lord. And I pray, Father, that if one's listening that's, that's lost, I pray that they'd accept you before it's eternally too late. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be a blessing and be an encouragement to your people. Lord, I pray that we'd draw closer to you tonight. 
In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things, and amen. I want to focus on that phrase in verse number 7, that saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. See, it was no surprise that Jesus was to be crucified, and that He was going to rise again. Yet the disciples did not believe it, but Jesus said it of Himself time and time again. Um, I read about uh, a woman who wrote J. Vernon McGee. She said this to him. J. Vernon McGee is a very uh, popular uh, Bible commentator. She said this. She said, Our preacher said that on Easter, Jesus just swooned on the cross and the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? McGee replied, Dear sister, beat your preacher with a leather whip for 39 heavy strokes, nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, put him in an airless tomb for three days, then see what happens. And listen, friends, that's what happened to Jesus. He was crucified on the cross. And for the next few minutes, I just want to talk about the agony of that crucifixion. The crucifixion of Christ was necessary for the resurrection of Christ. To see, it was a prophetic agony that Jesus went through on the cross. Psalm 22 verse 1 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. That was not the words of Christ. Those were the prophetic words of the psalmist. Uh, that's, one of the, that's what is known as the Messianic Psalms. That's one of them. That was a psalm of David. And those words sound very familiar. We'll come back to them in a little bit. I'll read it again. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Psalm 22 verse 6 says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despise of the people. Psalm 22 verse 7 says, And all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. That sounds like that crowd that hung around Jesus at the cross that was around the crucifixion that were watching Him. They said He, he, um, he said that He is God. Let Him deliver Himself from the cross. That was foretold by the prophets uh, and even by the psalmist in Psalm 22. Psalm 22, 14, the Bible says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. It's believed that Jesus died of a medical condition of a broken heart. He was so broken hearted for His people. His, his burden was so heavy. The weight of sin was so heavy. He literally died of a broken heart. And whenever the spear was thrust into His side, His bones were not broken. Uh, traditionally, the soldiers would come and break the bones of those thieves on the cross to speed up their death. They came to Jesus and they realized that He was dead and they thrust a spear at his side and the water and the blood came gushing out. Uh, that was foretold in Psalm 22. Psalm 22, 15, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Uh, you can imagine the heat of that day and the, the exhaustion of the Savior as He hung up there on the cross, uh, the sweating profusely from trying to get a, a gasping and struggling for every breath as He would hang on that cross and they would hang those those uh folks being crucified at their knees at a 45 degree angle so that they would have to thrust themselves up to exhale and to inhale just to breathe was excruciating pain. And it says that, and you can imagine, we know that Jesus said, I thirst upon the cross. And so you can imagine how dry he was. That was even foretold by the prophets. Psalm 22 verse 16 says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm 22 17, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Psalm 22 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That even when we know that, that the soldiers even uh, took his uh, vesture and cast lots for them there at the foot of the cross and they were playing games and gambling there at the foot of the cross 
cross of Christ. I heard a friend of mine preach a message one time, playing games at the foot of the cross. And listen, friends, I assure you that what happened on the cross that day was no game. What happened when we celebrate Easter and what the meaning of this day was no game. It was very serious. And that, um, and someone maybe tonight, listen, it's no time to be, you've been playing games with the cross. You've been playing games with your sin. And listen, I, I promise you tonight, listen, the Lord wants that to stop. Listen, stop that tonight and quit playing games with Jesus. Uh, but we go back to the scourging and the suffering that Jesus had there on the cross. And I thought about as I was getting this ready, the scourging that took place whenever the Romans who did not invent crucifixion, uh, but it could certainly be said that they did perfect it and they were very good at it, uh, but they would scourge their victims. Um, they would scourge those people uh, that they were going to crucify, oftentimes to soften them up, to uh, lose maybe the, the loss of blood, uh, the stress on their bodies would speed up their death because crucifixion otherwise was a very slow, very agonizing, very long death. Um, and so I began to look at what scourging was in biblical times. Uh, the Romans were more severe than the Jews in their scourging. Uh, they, were, they were more severe. It was, like I said, used to quicken the death of the one being crucified. Um, the church historian Eusebius recounts the, with vivid, horrible detail a scene of scourging. Not the one of Christ, but the, it was a very common practice. He says, the bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated with scourges even to the innermost veins and arteries so that the hidden inward parts of the body both their bowels and their members were exposed to view. See, the Romans did not just use a, uh, a whip. Uh, they used a cat of nine tails. It was very, had very long pieces of leather. Many of us are familiar with that. They would oftentimes put pieces of uh, pottery in the end of that uh, or rocks or stones, very sharp ones in the end of that. So that and then they would stretch the victim's body uh, over a stump or over a stone and they would stretch them out so that that the skin would be tight and then they would lash them. They would take that whip and dig it in and then strip the flesh and they would use it to strip that off their body. And not only would it strip down the back and down the backside, but also around the neck and around the face. And I can imagine Jesus's face had already been mutilated by the plucking out of his beard. They pulled the hair out of his face. And you can imagine how sore and how, how bloody and how ragged that was. But then to have that cat of nine tails lashed into his back and how much pain that must have caused. It was even foretold in the book of Isaiah 52 verse 13. The Bible says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form like the sons of men. That verse means that they were astonished at what they saw when they saw Jesus being scourged there that day. Uh, he had literally been turned into a piece of, of raw meat. And verse uh, Isaiah 52, 15 says, So shall he sprinkle many nations, and the kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. And then it goes on to, into Isaiah chapter number 53 that describes the suffering of our Savior. And so it was a prophesied agony. agony. It was also a particular agony. Uh, if you turn, if you look in your Bibles, uh, don't take the time to turn there. We don't have time. Luke chapter 22, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread uh, drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And... Uh, the chief priest and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. And so it was a particular agony. The Jews didn't realize it, but the Passover was a picture of what Christ was about to do on the cross. John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ, he realized it, he knew it, and when he said it in John 1.29... John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming, the Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That wasn't just some clever, uh, some clever name that John gave him. It was a particular name. It was important. He was described as the Lamb of God, as the Lamb of God, because he was God's perfect holy Lamb that had come to be the perfect sacrifice. See, the Jews were familiar with the Passover Lamb. Uh, if you go to Exodus chapter number 12, it gives the account of the 
the first Passover, where the people were saved from the wrath of God only by having the blood of a spotless lamb applied to the doorpost of their home. And any home that didn't have the blood applied experienced God's wrath, which was death of the firstborn. Listen, it was no accident that Jesus was crucified at this time. The agony that He would suffer would be the ultimate sacrifice to pay for the sin of the entire world. The Bible says the wages or the payment for sin is death. And then lastly, it was a pardoning agony. Isaiah 52 verse 14 says that Jesus says that Jesus, God's perfect Son, the spotless Lamb, was made unrecognizable. They couldn't even tell what He looked like by the beating that, they, that was given to Him before He went to the cross. What was the real, but what was the real agony on the cross? Was it the physical suffering that Jesus endured? Uh, absolutely. I say, I could not imagine. He, he, it was a supernatural suffering. I don't believe any normal man could do that. The God-man in the flesh was able to endure that and it wasn't the suffering that killed him. He laid his life down. He gave his life. But what was the agony that was on the cross? The agony was the sin. Your sin. My sin. The sin of the entire world. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For He, that is God, hath made Him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that is Jesus. He was perfect. He was sinless. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The prophet in Habakkuk, uh, in Habakkuk chapter number one, said that the holy God that, of the holy God that He was of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look upon iniquity. See, that day God turned His face away from His Son. Matthew 27, verse 46, Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? See, Jesus that day, God could not look upon sin because Jesus became sin. Even the sun refused to shine. The world was dark. The earth was dark. Jesus was sin. The sinless dying for the sin of man. The Bible even says in Mark 14, verse 15, that His disciples forsook Him had as well. What a sad, what a sad comedy. You imagine the heartbreak of being there, hanging on that cross alone, enduring the weight of your sin and mine. The agony of the cross was more than just the physical. It was the emotional, spiritual agony of becoming the sin of all mankind and being forsaken by His Father. I love what Jesus says, though, as He prepares to take His final agonizing breath on this earth. In John 19, verse 30, he said, It is finished. The great work of redemption was complete. It was done. But you know, I'm glad that he didn't say, I am finished. Because you see, the story doesn't end there. And I thank God for that this evening. I think about that old song. Oh no, the old story will never grow old. Of Jesus who died to save my soul. Oh no, the old story will never grow old. The story will never grow old. I'm glad that even though he was laid in that tomb, he didn't stay there. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor Mike. Uh, if you'll stay, just go ahead and stay right in Luke chapter 24. Uh, you know, I appreciate that, that, that message on the agony of Christ and what exactly He went through on that cross and through His death. But praise the Lord that He did not stay that way. But what astounds me is that through all of that, Jesus Christ was whipped, He was scourged, as, as Pastor Mike just talked about. He did all of that, get this, without sin. Not once did he in his mind curse out the Roman soldiers that had just whipped him. Not once did he have a bad, evil thought towards the ones that were literally gambling for his clothes. Not once did Jesus Christ ever commit a sin in the 33 and a half years he was here with us in flesh and blood. And that absolutely astounds me. So we have come to the point now where Jesus Christ has been crucified. Joseph of 
Arimathea has taken his body and laid him in a grave. And then of course we know and what we are celebrating today is that three days later on that Sunday morning, Jesus Christ came bursting forth out of that grave in glory and majesty and power. And when he did so, he defeated once and for all death, hell, sin, and the grave. Why? Because Jesus was the ultimate Passover sacrifice. You see, as was already mentioned, the Jews every year had to offer a Passover sacrifice which came all the way back from their slavery in Egypt. And so every year that that lamb was slain. But when Jesus, God's holy, perfect, spotless, sinless lamb was slain, and when he arose from the dead, he had finished everything that he needed to finish for the redemption of mankind. And so he had raised from the dead. And I want us to pick up in a story here just for the next uh, few minutes in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And the story I want us to look at, we're going to look at one, one uh, we're going to look at one of the appearances uh, uh, physically of Jesus Christ after the resurrection. And the one I want to look at is the road to Emmaus. You see, Jesus Christ had already at this point, uh, he, had, he had shown himself to Mary um, and to some others. Uh, we are told that he was there for 40 days, 40 days after his resurrection, between the resurrection and the ascension. And between that, he showed himself to about, we're told, 500 plus people. And so Jesus, at this point in this story, goes and shows himself to two people. And let's read a couple verses. Let's start in verse 13. And actually, in the next few minutes, I'm going to cover 20 verses worth of material. So you listen fast, and I'm going to preach fast. Luckily, you're watching me on a TV or phone, so you can pause, rewind if you miss something, all right? Uh, Verse 13, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together... And reason, Jesus himself, get that, Jesus himself, after the resurrection, drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, watch this, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Now skip with me to verse 27. Says so this, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then skip to verse 32. And they said one to another, focus on this phrase real quick for a few, moment, for a few moments. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? What had happened in this story, uh, for sake of time, Pastor Mike already prayed for our service, so I'm not going to take another break and do that. But so for, for sake of time, we're going to jump right in this. And I want us to talk, uh, Pastor Mike talked about the agony. We're going to talk here for just a minute about one of the appearances Of Jesus Christ. And we have that here in this story of the road to Emmaus. Jesus comes and he goes to two 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 men that are walking down this road. And he comes up to them and he peers to them. And the first thing I want you to notice about this road to Emmaus experience is the sad countenance of these two men. Look at verse 17. Jesus said unto them, What matter of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk? And then he asks this question, and are sad. You see, Easter morning should be the joyous, the most happy day of a Christian's life. Why? Because we celebrate it as the day that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. He is no longer in his grave like these other gods that the rest of the world serves. He is no longer in those grave clothes because he has bursted forth out from the grave and come conquered death. And so here these two men were walking down the road and they were very clearly because Jesus mentioned it himself, they were sad. And Jesus asked them why were they sad? And they, they answered and they told Jesus, they said, are, are, are you a stranger in this country? Are you a stranger to these places? Don't you know what just transpired over the last few days? Didn't you hear about this Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, who was beaten, who was mocked, who was uh, all these awful things, and then he was laid in a grave? <laughs> 
And they said, have you not heard about this? You see, this promised Messiah was with us and he dwelt with us. And we saw him heal people. We saw him feed thousands with, with just five loaves of bread and two fish. We saw him turn water into wine. We saw him walk on the water. We saw him heal the lame legs. We, made, we saw him put mud on somebody's eyes and they were able to see again. And even a couple times they say, we saw this man called the dead back to life. That was the man we have spent the last three and a half years with. And Jesus goes on, or these two men go go on and tell Jesus all about what Jesus had done. You see, they didn't know it was Jesus at this point. And these two men even admit in verse 23 and 24 that they had gone to the grave. They had gone to the empty tomb. They had seen the, 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 the door of the stone of the tomb rolled away. And then we see this. So you have one, the sad countenance, but secondly, as we're moving along quite quickly, the surreal counsel. Look at this. This absolutely blows my mind. Look at verse 25. Then he said unto them, Jesus now addresses these two men. O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? As Pastor Mike just mentioned, all of these sufferings were necessary. They were not just things that Jesus went to so we could brag on him. Each and every step of the way Jesus went through and dealt with something and was in agonizing pain for a reason. And so Jesus tells them, ought not Christ, in verse 26, to have suffered these things. And then look at verse 27, Jesus, uh, and it says, and beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. What had happened is Jesus now turns to these two guys in verse 25 and 26, he rebukes them. And then in verse 27, and we are told that Jesus now starts teaching them. Jesus, the greatest preacher of all, the preacher of preachers, begins to preach to these two men as they are walking to Emmaus. And he says that he expounds the scriptures starting with Moses. I believe it may have went something like, G- like this. Jesus turns to these two men. And he says, hey, don't you realize that the blood on the doorpost that, that, that you put, oh, that the Israelites put over the doorpost when that death angel come, don't you realize that's a picture of Christ? He says, the manna in the wilderness when, you, when your fathers were wandering in the wilderness because of their disobedience, don't you understand that was a picture of Christ? The water that sprang forth out of the rock when Moses struck it, don't you understand that's a picture of Christ? The Passover lamb that you offered every year, don't you understand that's a picture of Christ? And he says, don't you understand that, that I created the heavens and the earth, that I uphold everything with my words, and, and that I am all powerful? And Jesus Christ Himself starts to tell these two men about Himself. And he goes through the Old Testament and gives them all the Christophanies and, and teaches them all of all the pictures present. In the Old Testament that point to him. You know Boaz and Ruth. Boaz is a picture and a type of Jesus Christ. And we could go on and on and on about all of the pictures and the types of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And they must have done that for some time on this road and walk to Emmaus. How awesome would it be to be able to walk and talk with Jesus Christ? Thirdly, and this uh, is one of my favorite evangelists says... Here's the message. This right here is the message. If you've not paid a a, a lick of attention to anything up until this point, I beg you to pay attention now. Thirdly, first we had the sad countenance, then we had the surreal counsel. Look now in verse 32, the supernatural craving. The supernatural craving. In verse 32, these disciples, now the the walk to Emmaus had ended. Uh, In verse 30, it says, And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. He took bread, blessed it, and break it, and gave it to them. And then it says in verse 31, And their eyes were opened, and and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. You see, these two men all along that walk had no idea it was Jesus. They had no idea that this was the risen Christ that was walking with them and that was talking with them. They thought this was some random stranger that knew all about the Old Testament scriptures, knew all about the Old Testament prophecies. But now, after Jesus had sat at meet with them, it says in verse 31 that now their eyes were open. And then in verse 32, something astounding and, and, and uh, uh, awesome happens. These two men turn to each other. And they, they say this. Look at verse 32. 
Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? These two men look at each other and say, hey, didn't uh, while, while we were walking on that Emmaus road, <coughs> excuse me. While you and I were walking on the man's road with that man, did not your heart crave to hear more? Did not your heart yearn to hear more? Did not your heart beg to hear this man expound and to preach the scriptures more and more and to learn more and to walk with Jesus more? And so they turn to each other and they have this this meeting of the minds and they say, oh, my heart burned to hear more from that man. And my question to you, and here's the message. What does your heart burn for? I'm not talking about spicy foods, okay? I'm not talking about anything that may, gives you that acid reflux. Spiritually, what does your heart yearn for? What does it crave for? Does it crave for money? Does it crave for things, a bigger house, a nicer car? Or does your heart crave to walk and talk with Jesus Christ? Now I know, and i got to close. Some of you are sitting here right now, and you're thinking, you know what? If Jesus were to appear to me on a road... If I were driving to Charleston and Jesus were to appear in my car and start preaching to me, yeah, that would make my heart yearn a little bit too. Ding, 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 wake up, new, extra, extra, read all about it. Every day Jesus says, I have supplied myself to walk with you. In John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the verse 14 says, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You see, every day we can walk and talk with Jesus Christ. And, and, and if your heart has never yearned to read the Bible and to talk with Jesus Christ, I really feel sorry for you. There have been days when my heart has just yearned to walk and talk with Jesus Christ. There have been times when I've woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the morning and I could not fall back asleep and guess what? My heart yearned and craved and burned to talk and walk with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that can happen when we get into this word right here. Christian, what does your heart burn for? Would you make a decision and say, Lord, and, and pray and seek God's face and say, oh God, would you please help my heart burn for you? Lord, would you please come beside me and walk with me and talk with me and expound the scriptures to me. Yes, preachers do that all the time we get in our pulpit. Our, our job as preachers is to seek God on your behalf and to open his word and to give you something fresh from the presence of God. But you see, you got Monday through Saturday to feed yourselves. Monday through Saturday, you ought to be asking God, Oh God, would you please burden my heart to hear from you? Christian, will you do that? Will you pray? Will you read God's holy, infallible, perfect, inspired word? Would you do that? Amen. As we continue on, I want to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, we'll look at verses 6 through 14 and just share a few thoughts about that. Uh, the idea of the ascension, the ascension. You know, this past month and a half, as far as in God's Word, uh, have been kind of a whirlwind for the, for the disciples, you might say. Uh, just 40 days earlier, they had seen his, his agony as they saw him die on a cross. And Pastor Mike mentioned that so well. And uh, their dreams and hopes seemed to come crashing down, you might say. Uh, they had uh, hid themselves away in fear of facing the same fate that possibly Jesus did. But three days after Jesus died, they saw his appearing. And I appreciate Pastor Josh and how well illustrated that. He was alive again, and the Lord had risen from the dead, and there was hope. Still they wavered. They were up and they were down. Let's look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel, or to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and under the othermost part of the earth. Verse number nine. And when they had spoken these when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. 
which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come up, they went in the upper room. They abode with Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus and uh, Simon Zelotus and Judah, the brother of James. Well, let's look at this here for a few minutes. The Lord took them aside and began to teach them some truths that they desperately needed to know. Verse 3 of uh, John or Acts chapter 1 says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He's going away. He tells them he's leaving his work. He's leaving this ministry into their hands. They needed to know what the Lord expected of them. And he taught them that. They needed to know what they were going to be doing. And the Lord taught them that. They needed comfort uh, for their troubled hearts. And he gave them that comfort. He spent 40 days with his men instructing them, comforting them, and spending time with them. After spending the 40 days with Jesus, after his resurrection, the disciples were standing with Jesus on the Mount of Olives. He gives them some final words of instruction. Then while they're watching him, he begins to rise up, ascending into the heavens. Suddenly, he's gone. They see his ascension. He's taken from their presence, and they're left in bewilderment on the mountain without him. In that moment, the disciples were filled with more questions, as you can imagine, more questions than they had answers for. Their minds, uh, no doubt, had confusing thoughts after what they had just experienced, after what they had just witnessed take place. They stand there looking up in the sky, and the angels, the messengers from God, appear to them and say, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? In other words, the angels say, What are you looking at? What are you looking at up into the heavens? What are you focused on? That's the thought I'd like to kind of finish on this evening. Point out some issues I believe we find in God's Word. You know, the first thing I notice is this compelling departure. Think about this. While Jesus stands with His disciples here on the Mount of Olives, instructing them in their task and in His truth, this is His last moment, His last little bit of instructions. He's telling them, and then the next thing you know, He is ascending up into the sky, taken up into heaven. Gravity, gravity suddenly lost its power, and He was being lifted up right in front of them, just as He said that He would. Now it says that he began to, um, he disappeared into a cloud. And I don't believe the, the, the word cloud here refers to necessarily a rain cloud per se. I believe it talks about the glory cloud that s- surrounds the presence of an almighty God. In other words, when it came time for Jesus to leave this world, his father received him up into his father's glory and took him home. After Jesus ascends into heaven, His disciples looked steadfastly towards heaven. They were gazing into heaven, as it says in verse 11. Now the word steadfastly, or gazing, translates the same word. It means to fix the eyes upon, to look intently at something. It means they were transfixed. You ever found yourself just like in a daze or in awe staring at something, trying to figure out what you just saw? I can't believe I just saw that. I can't believe, is that that really what I think it is? I believe that's how they were standing there, like, you know, wow. What I mean, what just took place as they stared and, and looked towards the heavens as they gazed? They really shouldn't have been amazed. They really shouldn't have been amazed. I think about in my in my life even, and probably in yours, uh, so often we pray in faith, believing, asking God to do something to meet a particular need, and He does, and we're like, wow. Well, we did ask Him to do that, and He does hear and answer prayers, but He had taught them that He was going away. 
In John chapter 6, verse 62, he says, What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? He's going to ascend back up to where he was before. In John 16, 28, the Bible says, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go unto the Father. He'd shared the fact he was going to do that. Um, I believe that this transfixing, this looking and gazing of the disciples into heaven speaks more of just them standing there in utter amazement. Oh, I'm sure they were amazed, no doubt. It suggests they were looking after him and looking towards him. Um, maybe they were worried about what's going to happen now. They had lost someone forever, someone they had been very close to for several years. I believe it suggests that as they look, there's a, a hopelessness and a, and a sadness as they observed what was going on. The Bible says in verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, steadfastly, for the disciples, the ascension of the Lord back to heaven changed everything from them. Things weren't going to be the same. It was different now. For the last three years, these men had spent nearly every moment with the Lord Jesus Christ. They left their families, their friends, and their businesses to follow him, and now he's gone from their physical presence, and they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. The Lord's departure left the disciples confused and concerned. They didn't understand completely why that he had to leave them while he returned to the Father. I'm going to look at just a few thoughts concerning that. There's at least three reasons that I find in God's Word as to why Jesus had to go to heaven while his men stayed there. The first thing I know is if Jesus had not gone away, the Spirit of God could not have come. That comforter could not have come. That Holy Spirit of God could not have come. Look at the Bible says in John 16 and verse 7. The Bible says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. I think it's interesting, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. These men had been walking by sight. They lived with Jesus. They heard his voice. They saw his miracles. They felt his touch. He was a tangible thing to them. They were living, for the most part, by sight. But when Jesus died on the cross, his disciples were filled with fear. The Bible says in John 20 and verse 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. <laughs> Even after the resurrection, some of, the, uh, some of them nearly quit on the Lord. In John 21 and verse 21-3, uh, it says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. They say unto him, We go also with thee. They went forth and entered into the ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. These men that were accustomed to being with Jesus seemingly didn't feel like they could function without him. Now, I want to say something about that. They were pretty much right. They could not function without Him. You and I couldn't function without Him. But we, as we trust Christ as our Savior, He comes and indwells us, and we're able to work with the Holy Spirit's power in our life. So they're right. Before, in that in-between, when He left them, they, they couldn't function. They, they, they were concerned. They didn't know what to do. When Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit comes. These men learn to walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible tells us that in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. The Spirit of God will be with them to empower them for service. And Jesus wanted His men to accomplish great things. He would accomplish that through the Holy Spirit. John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Who's he? That person that believeth on him. 
The works that Jesus Christ did, those that believe on Him will do those works also. That's astounding. That's, a, that's amazing that through the Holy Spirit we can accomplish those things. But look what else it says in John 21.3. Um, I'm sorry, in John 14.12. And greater works than these shall He do because I go unto my Father. Incredible what can be accomplished through the Holy Spirit of God on these men. We enjoy the same blessings today. Because Jesus went away, the Spirit came. He dwells within every child of God. Everyone that's called on Jesus by faith, He dwells within them to guide them, to help them, to comfort them, and instruct them in the ways of God. Jesus, had He not gone away, the Spirit of God could not have come. You know, something else I notice here, Jesus went to heaven to make intercession for them. When He ascended back unto heaven at the right hand of the Father, He was going to make intercession for you and for I. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, "...who be in the brightness of His glory..." In the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, I can't explain how all this works, but the Bible teaches that when Jesus ascended up into heaven, he took his people with him. He talks about that where I am there you may be also. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 6, And hath raised us up together, and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm as good as in heaven already because of what He did for me. Not because of what I've done, but because what He did for me. Here... Um, He's here today as our representative guaranteeing that uh, where He is, one day you will be also. John 14, 1 through 3. I love this passage of Scripture. It says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. <laughs> we have a representative on the inside, you might say. Our Savior is in the presence of God where He ever lives to make intercession for us, it tells us in Hebrews 7.25. That is when sin creeps into our lives and when Satan accuses us before the throne of God, we have a Savior on the right hand of the Father that says that debt's already been paid for. Paid in full. <laughs> How many of you like to have your debts paid in full? Well, I don't know about your financial debts, but I know one thing. We have a Lord and Savior that's already shed His blood for our sins. That sin debt that we owed. Thank the Lord for that. His presence in heaven is why that saints of God are eternally secure. The Savior is ever interceding with the Father. Thus we're able to stand both now and later blameless in the Father's sight. Jude 1.24 says this, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless <laughs> before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Isn't that incredible? Christ came and died on an old rugged cross and was buried and rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us and gets great joy out of that. Well, I'm down here, I mess up. And he says, uh, that's... I've already paid for his. I, I, I've already paid his way. And he gets great joy. Let me read that again. 
That's a wonderful verse. Jude chapter 1 verse 24. That, that verse will encourage you. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Wow. I notice a third reason. Jesus went to heaven so that he could return for his people one day, just as he promised in Scripture. Before he went to the cross, he promised that he would return to his people. The angels at the ascension reaffirmed that promise. And uh, even as Scripture closes in Revelation 22 and verse 20, Jesus said, Surely I come quickly. All we as believers have ever known is that Jesus is not here physically. We haven't had that appearing. We haven't had that walking with by sight. We live by faith. But I want to remind you that while he is not here with us physically, he is physically present at the right hand of the Father. One day, He'll return and take those that have trusted Christ with Him to heaven. He is coming again. I ask you this question when I think about um, reading God's Word and I think about the Christian life and, and the Bible um, and we wonder what's happening, a good question might be to ask yourself is, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Are you caught up in the wonder of a risen Savior who loves you and who gave himself for you in the cross of Calvary? Are you caught up in Jesus and, and his glory? That's a wonderful thing. It means you're saved and you'll be ready to meet Jesus when he comes again. Are you confused about turns that life has taken? Are you worried over the future and what it holds for you? Are you worried about today or tomorrow? I want to challenge you to leave that in the hands of an ascended Savior that sits at the right hand of the Father. You know, I appreciate His agony and what He went through for you and for me. He took all that suffering and pain for you and me. And I'm thankful for his appearing. I'm glad that he proved physically his resurrection and walked among people for many days. And I'm thankful that for his ascending. And he's in heaven seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. You know, the Bible tells us he's not willing that any would perish. He wants all to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you this evening, on Easter Sunday, in, in, a, in a world full of pandemonium, you might say, with struggles on every hand and serious and things we need to pray about and we work towards and, and help and do what we can, but there is hope. There's a living Savior that loves you and wants you to come to know Him as your Lord and Savior. Won't you trust Him this evening? Before it's eternally too late, won't you call on his name? I ask you to do that. The Bible tells us that we're sinners. I mention that every service. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sin has a penalty. You know, we go to work and we expect a wage. We expect to get something for what we've done. We commit a crime, we expect to get something for what we've done. Well, the wages of sin, there's something to be expected for that as well. It's death. It also says, but the gift of God, which is Jesus Christ, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. What about it this evening? Why don't you say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me my sins? I realize you're the only way I can get to heaven. Would you come into my heart and save me? I want to live for you. Wouldn't you do that this evening? Christian, can you not rejoice in the fact that we have a Savior that's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us? He went through the agony of, 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 of crucifixion and, and death and burial. He went through that struggle. He was mocked and abused and ridiculed. 
And then he appeared uh, amongst many people. We have uh, records of that. And then ascended. Should we not rejoice in the salvation we have? I don't know what your need is this evening, but I trust you'll turn to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the service we've had tonight, for the Word of God that's been preached so well. Pastor Mike and Pastor Josh. And God, I pray you'll use those words. Well, we're just men, we're just vessels carrying a message that you've given us. It's your word. God, I pray that it would not return void, that someone would call on you or someone would be encouraged even tonight. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I trust you've enjoyed the service this evening. Had a lot of different things that, we, that I thought were good. And I look forward to the day we can assemble here again together as a church family. But thank you for inviting us into your home for turning on YouTube or Facebook and allowing us to reach in and just share with you from God's Word. If you did make a decision for Christ, I, I wish you'd let us know. If you trusted Christ especially, we'd love to send something to you to get you kind of started in your Christian life. So if you could uh, write us or call the office or send an email, you can find those things on the website. But God bless you, and until the next time, we'll return on Wednesday evening. Looking forward to that time. God bless you.